it's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Philips 346B1C. The OSD is controlled by pressable buttons on the underside of the bottom bezel towards the right side. You can see that there are button labels just printed at the front there. And there's also a power LED, and that glows white when the monitor is on, and it flashes white when the monitor enters a low power state, so signal to the computer is lost. If you press the first button there, it allows you to select a smart image preset. I'm not going to go through these in too much detail. For the most part, they just change various settings in the OSD. The easy read setting is quite interesting because it makes everything black and white. Of course, the background I was using happened to be black and white, as a happy little coincidence anyway. But if you look down there, you can see that the desktop icons have gone monochrome. Now, whether this makes it easy to read things or not, that's open to interpretation, but I guess it makes it easier to focus on text and ignore sort of flashy colours that might be for images around the, the text and that kind of thing. The office setting, it just sort of messes up the saturation and sharpness and stuff. And the photo setting as well, it just ups the saturation, gives a bit of oversaturation, over sharpening. Movie mode does the same, gives things an overly cool tint. So basically they just upset the image in various different ways and just change things that you can actually change in the OSD for the most part. The game setting, it's quite similar to photo really, a little bit less extreme in terms of the extra saturation. Economy, that just lowers the brightness to a fairly low level. Low blue mode, that's actually one of the more useful ones, but I'll go through this when I look at the setting in the OSD itself, because there are various different subsettings associated with this. Smart uniformity, that's explored in the written review, and this is a uniformity compensation setting, a digital uniformity compensation setting, designed to even out the brightness at different regions of the screen. Or off, which is my preferred setting, just allows you to fully adjust everything manually in the menu system. The second button along, if you press that when you haven't entered the main OSD system, allows you to select the input used by the monitor. So there's HDMI, DisplayPort or USB-C. The third button along is a user key. That means you can configure it in the OSD. But by default, it's KVM, Keyboard Virtual Mouse. And what this means is the monitor has two USB 3 upstreams and you can have your peripherals connected to the monitor and have two separate systems connected to the monitor with the upstream ports. So that means you can assign the peripherals to different systems depending on which upstream port you've selected. So that's what the KVM functionality does. If you've got your system connected to USB-C and that's the one you want to use, you can select USB-C. USB up is just the separate upstream port, the secondary upstream port if you like. Or you can have it automatically select the desired port for you. I don't use this functionality, so either way it doesn't really matter for me. The fourth button along is the main menu system, and the power button is next to that, which I'm not going to press now. I think you can work out what that one does. So the first thing, power sensor, you can set that between 0 and 4, and what this does is it will dim the screen and Eventually, it'll actually turn the screen off so that it's not displaying an image. If you are not using the computer, so you're not detected in front of the monitor, it has an infrared sensor just to the left of the Philips logo. And you'll be able to see this pulsing on the video when I actually enable this feature. So if you turn it on and then select one of these, you'll probably be able to see a little pulsing. I'm not sure if you can see that on the video. It's uh, something I can see on the preview screen just there. But you can't see that to your eye. It's an infrared pulse. It's just trying to detect if a user is present. And the numbers here correspond to a distance away that it'll scan for the user. So I don't know if this corresponds to meters, but I found a setting of two worked well for me. It always detected me when I was using the monitor, but if I left the room, it would dim. And I'll show you what happens when it dims, but you have to leave it for a minute before it'll actually dim. So I'll just fast forward a little bit. So there you go, it's dimmed the screen and it gives you a little message saying that the saving mode is on in the middle of the screen, the power sensor. 
And I don't know how long it takes, but eventually it'll actually turn the screen off completely, or it'll at least stop displaying an image, so everything will just go black. And I don't know how long that takes. I think it's perhaps five minutes or so, but I think you can imagine what a black screen looks like, so I don't have to show you that phase. And then if you come back to the monitor, you start using it again, it comes back to life. And even if it's gone completely off, it springs back to life quite quickly. So I find this quite intuitive to use. I used it most of the time. Next there's light sensor. So there's a light sensor integrated into the monitor that allows the monitor to adjust its brightness according to the ambient lighting in your room. I didn't like this setting and that's because it doesn't allow you to adjust things manually. You can see that the brightness is still enabled. You can adjust that, but if you do, it'll just completely ignore what you've done and disable the setting. So I've adjusted that now and the light sensor setting will in fact be disabled. Of course, users have their own preferences for brightness. Everyone's eyes are different. So the fact that it sort of dictates what the brightness will be based on your room lighting without giving you any real input yourself is not great. Some people might still like to use it though. Next is low blue mode, so these low blue light settings. There are various different effectivenesses, so one being the least effective mode, four being the most effective. These work well to reduce the blue light output from the monitor. They're explored a bit in the written review and it's useful to reduce blue light output, particularly in the evenings or hours leading up towards bed when you're supposed to be sleeping, your body's supposed to be unwinding. It's good to cut out blue light because blue light's stimulating and it keeps your body alert, which isn't what you want when you're trying to go to sleep. Next is input, and that allows you to select the input used by the monitor. You can have it automatically select the input. You can enable or disable that functionality if you want, if it's causing you issues and it's not using the correct input, the one that you want to use. Next is Picture, Adaptive Sync, that enables the FreeSync or NVIDIA G-Sync compatible mode functionality of the monitor. This Picture mode, you can see that's greyed out, and that's because you need to be using HDMI. I'm using DisplayPort at the moment. You need to be using HDMI to actually see these. So I'll just plug in an HDMI cable quickly so I can show you this menu. There you go, I've got HDMI connected now and you'll see that the picture format menu is available. These are really settings designed when you're using a non-native resolution. So I'm using the native 3440 by 1440 at the moment. So these aren't really applicable, but they do still have an effect. So there's four by three, and that would be applicable if you're using a four by three aspect ratio resolution. There's 16 by nine, which in theory should work if you're using a 16 by nine aspect ratio resolution. I'm just going to switch over to full HD and show you something because this doesn't actually do what you might think. So I'll just select full HD resolution. So I'm running things in the full HD resolution and I've got the 16 by 9 mode selected and you can see that things are just squashed up. Things don't look as they should at all. Squashed up rather than looking as they should. So I'm not sure why it does that. It doesn't seem to really do what it should do. That particular setting. There's movie one and movie two. I have no idea how you enable these. I think they're zoom and crop settings. Perhaps you need to have specific resolutions being used to enable them. I'm not sure, but the resolutions I'm interested in has no effect. One to one is a one to one pixel mapping feature. So you can see the full HD resolution is now undistorted. It's in the middle of the screen, whereas before it was sort of stretched out vertically, so it looked really weird. And if I select a different resolution, so 2560 by 1440, that's one that people might like to use sometimes as well. You can see that that makes better use of the space, undistorted image. And with this particular resolution, it would be exactly the same if you have widescreen selected here. And if you don't have this menu enabled because you're using DisplayPort, then this is what will happen if you're using the 2560 by 1440 resolution anyway. So it doesn't give you distortion, it gives you a completely undistorted image, but you do have a black border to the left and right. So this just looks like a 27 inch screen, 16 by nine, 2560 by 1440, just cuts out the extra pixels, which make this an ultra wide display. And in the written review, there's an interpolation and upscaling section 
which talks a little bit more about this and the experience and also talks about the interpolation process that's used if you have the ultra wide settings selected as I do now and you're using a resolution which would have to use that. So again, just to remind you, if I'm running the full HD resolution and I've got the widescreen setting enabled, apologies if I called it ultra wide or something else before, the Screen space, again, it looks like it did with the 2560 by 1440, except that interpolation has to be used because this is a lower resolution. It doesn't actually fill up the pixels fully. So there are 2560 by 1440 physical pixels on this monitor running down from top to bottom, and this resolution does not match that. So interpolation is being used, and this process is explored in the written review. But a quick spoiler, it does a pretty decent job. Next up, you've got your brightness control, contrast and sharpness. You adjust the brightness and contrast by single unit increments as usual. The sharpness control is adjusted in increments of 10 between 0 and 100. I find the default setting of 50 absolutely fine, so I have no need to adjust that, but if you want to adjust it according to your preferences you can. Smart response settings explored in the written review and a bit in the video review as well actually. Off, fast, faster and fastest. I prefer the faster setting myself. Smart contrast, this is a dynamic contrast feature which is explored in the review. Various different gamma settings. And I'm not going to say they're explored in the review. They are, but I'm getting a little bit sick of saying everything's explored in the review. I'm sure you can read that for yourself and work that out. 1.8, 2.0, 2.2, 2.4 .2, and 2.6. So decent flexibility with the gamma there. Next there's pixel orbiting and what that does is it just nudges everything by one pixel and then back to where it was. Very brief, does it very occasionally. I didn't really notice it doing this to be honest but I left it set to on and that's just because it's on by default, it wasn't causing any bother. But it's designed to reduce the chances of image retention. It doesn't mean that this monitor is prone to it. I didn't have any issues with image retention when I was using the monitor but this is a pretty standard feature on Philips monitors these days anyway. Overscan, that is greyed out and it's applicable to some older systems where you'd want the image to run off and that would be the sort of natural behaviour, so older games, consoles, that kind of thing. Next is PIP, P by P, picture in picture, picture by picture. So picture in picture gives you one source up there and the remaining source, the other source surrounding that. And if you've got that enabled, you can change the input used for the secondary source versus the primary source. You can change the size of the picture in picture window as well. So that's small, or there's middle, or there's large. And you can change the position of the window. So you can have it top right, top left, bottom right, or bottom left, depending on your preferences. And you can swap the sources that are used for the secondary and primary. There's also P by P, picture by picture, and this allows you to have two separate sources side by side. Next is audio, so you can adjust the volume of the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5mm jack, or you can mute those speakers, and you can select the audio source. So if you've got multiple systems connected to the monitor, you can have a separate audio source to your video signal, if you so wish. There's then colour menu, so you can adjust the colour temperature, there are various different settings here there's 5000K which is actually an effective low blue light setting and I talk a bit about this in the review. I actually prefer this to the low blue light settings, the main low blue mode settings and that's because it gets rid of the green tint which you get with the other low blue light settings. The contrast does have a little bit of a reduction because of this but the overall balance I prefer it and this is an effective low blue light setting as well. There's sRGB which is an sRGB emulation setting which Massively cuts down the colour gamut, also explored in the review. I'm sorry I did say I wasn't going to keep saying that, but uh, it is explored in the review, honest. User Define, that allows you to change the red, green and blue colour channels manually. There's then Language, and that allows you to change the language that the OSD is displayed in. Various different options there. OSD Settings, so that allows you to change the horizontal and vertical position of the OSD on the screen. You can enable a transparency effect or adjust how transparent it looks. I'm not really bothered by this either way to be honest so I just leave that off which is the default. OSD timeout so that's the period after the last button press before the OSD will automatically disappear. 
If you want, you can just press the exit button, which is the first button there, the left arrow a couple of times, and it will remove the OSD from the screen for you. User key, so I mentioned this before, that's the third button along, it has a little label there that says user, and this is set to KVM, keyboard virtual mouse by default. We can have it set to various other things, power sensor, multi-view, brightness or volume, depending on which thing you like to use a lot. So power sensor, if you want to quickly enable or disable that, you can now just hit the user key and you can change the level of the power sensor or turn it off very easily. Next is USB settings, which as you would expect, has settings related to the USB inputs of the monitor. So you can change the standard used by the USB ports, USB 3.2, they are USB 3.2 ports. However, it is noted on the product page and probably in the manual if you bother to read that, that if you're using USB-C on the monitor and you want to use the full 100 hertz at 3440 by 1440, you have to have USB 2.0 selected. So you won't get the same data transfer speed. So you will get the full capabilities of the monitor in terms of video signal, but you won't get the full data transfer speed. But I mean, I'm not really a USB person. I don't really know the difference in transfer speed between USB 2 and 3.2. Definitely a difference there, but I'm afraid you can't have USB 3 or USB 3 standard at the same time as the full video signal. Perhaps that's a bandwidth restriction. I'm not sure. I'm sure there's a technical reason for it, but it's really beyond my comprehension as a monitor reviewer. USB standby mode. So you can have the USB ports active when the monitor goes into standby, and that includes if you've pressed the power button to turn the monitor off. If you have this set to on, it draws a little bit more power, even if you're not using the USB ports. If you have this set to off, you can't use the USB ports, you can't charge things connected to them, etc. if the monitor is on standby. But your idle power draw does go down a little bit. KVM, keyboard virtual mouse, so that's the same thing I showed you with the user key earlier. Setup, resolution notification, this will just display a little message on the screen if you're not running the native resolution, just to remind you that 3440 by 1440 is optimal. Reset, so you can reset everything to the factory defaults. And finally, information. And this gives you some basic information, such as the model itself, the serial number, the resolution, and the refresh rate. And that refresh rate does change if you've got Adaptive Sync active and it's in the variable refresh rate window, and that will adjust according to your frame rate. So that's really all there is to the OSD on-screen display menu system, the Philips 346B1C. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.